This morning's scripture reading is going to be from the book of Luke, chapter 11, 37 through 44. That's Luke, chapter 11, verses 37 to 44. If you're using the Pew Bible, that will be page 763. Page 763 in the Pew Bible. Luke, chapter 11, starting at verse 37. And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that make that which is without make that which is within also, but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogue and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, and that and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Take your Bibles out and turn back to Luke chapter 11. We're continuing on in this passage, even as we remember the Reformation. And on October 31st, 1517, 503 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the church door. And in doing that, he launched what became known as the Protestant Reformation. We, as Presbyterians, as Bible Presbyterians, stand within that uh, Tradition, both of, of Protestant and then also today we use the term reform to describe the, the system of doctrine that we look to uh, believing that it comes from the Bible. The question that I just want to, by way of introduction, ask, what was at stake at the time of the Reformation? What was at stake in the life of the church? The church... The Roman Catholic Church at that day, which was the really only recognized church across the world. There were and had been pockets of believers that had sprung up in different areas before 1517. But by and large, the church was controlled by the Pope. The, tro the church was uh, really drunk on quite frankly, power and money as one of the most powerful entities in the world and, and one of the, the wealthiest entities in the world. And the question that Martin Luther posed in, in his 95 Thesis was really about the work of ministry. That if, if the, the Pope had the ability to forgive sins, why was he charging for that? Something else that was at stake in the Reformation was the very way that church was conducted. You see, the, the people would gather together and they would sit down in the pews and they would sit there and they would observe with their eyes what was happening and they would hear things, but they would not understand because the services were conducted in Latin. Latin was not the language of the world at that time. Uh, it certainly was an academic language. Most of the academic books being written for hundreds of years, even after the Reformation, were all written in Latin. But it was the language of church, and people would sit there, and like I said, they would observe with their eyes. They wouldn't know what was happening. One of the things that impacted Martin Luther was he once heard when he was visiting uh, another city, I believe it was the city of Rome, he heard a priest conducting the Mass, which was their take on the Lord's Supper. Uh, they had created all sorts of doctrines around that. But the, the priest was mocking everything that was happening. 
was making a, a mockery, was actually making a joke of it in Latin, which Luther knew, Luther heard. But the people sitting in the pews thought they were in the midst of a solemn worship service. They had no idea what was going on. Could you imagine being in a service and not know what is being spoken of? The church we're praying for, our church in Orlando, they conduct their services in Portuguese. And when you, if you were to go visit them, and they would love for you to go visit them, uh, just not all at once, please, but uh, you'd go and they would hand you a, uh, a listening device, much like the ones that we have out in the hallway, and they have somebody that would do a running translation for you. One Sunday when I was there, I was, I was preaching, and so I didn't take one of their headsets and uh, was a mistake because they didn't translate everything until uh, the, the till I preached. And so I didn't know what was happening. And Pastor Roberto was sitting next to me trying to tell me what was happening. It was an odd experience. Could you imagine that being your only option but without translation? And what is the theory that, that drives that? What is, what is the, the, the concept that, that would even motivate them to do that? Well, it's really addressed in the passage that is in front of us in Luke chapter 11. The only thing they were concerned about was an external going through the motions. If you sat when the church told you to sit, and then you, you, you came forward when the church told you to come forward, and you ate what the church told you to eat, you drank what the church told you to eat, and most importantly, you gave money when the church told you to give money, you must be right with the Lord. That was their position. And it still is. You're right, Dolores. It still is. Now, it, you know, what's, what's interesting, if you, you think about our church service, uh, I, we tell you to sit and we tell you to stand up. We don't have you come forward. We take communion, which is different than mass, completely different, but the elements are similar. Uh, we take it to you and, and you eat and you drink and uh, you, you, you give to the church and, and you say, but what's the difference? Well, everything's the difference because what we do isn't for earning God's grace. What we do isn't to earn salvation. What we do isn't merely an outward act. And, and I hope and I pray that it's not an outward act. When you, when you sing the hymns of the faith, I hope it's not an, an outward act only. But it comes from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That you have put your faith and your trust in the finished work of your Savior. And that you recognize and you know and you've embraced this great truth that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. in what Christ has done alone and everything else we do, quite frankly, is thanking God for all that he's done for us. That we're rejoicing this day because of the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not just something we're doing out of a sense of tradition, out of going through the motions. Jesus addresses that with the Pharisees starting in verse 37. He charges them with a foolish behavior. Notice what happens, verse 37. Jesus has been preaching, Jesus has been teaching. We've seen a heavy emphasis on the authority of the word of God, the proclamation of the gospel. Verse 37, Luke continues, And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. What a glorious thing. You know, one of the, one of the things that I find so fascinating as we work our way through the gospel of Luke is how many times about two things happen. One, Jesus goes into a home to sit down and eat. To, to fellowship with them, what kind of meal do you think that was? I love our fellowship meals. My kids love our fellowship meals. I hope you love that time of, of just sort of sitting and, and fellowshipping together. But, wow, what, what it would be to have Jesus physically present there or to have Jesus in your home. What an opportunity. What a blessing. What a joyous thing. But every time that happens... It seems to be sort of counterpointed by somebody who misses the point. In this case, it's the Pharisees 
that miss the point. Here they are face to face with the Son of God, the incarnate Word of God. And these are supposed to be religious leaders. They were supposed to know the law. They were supposed to be concerned about holiness and, and walking with the Lord. And what do they say about this scene? Verse 38 tells us they marveled. You think, well, they, they should marvel. But what are they marveling at? Look at it. Verse 38. And when the Pharisees saw it, when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So you notice he's invited Jesus. Here is this Pharisee. And when he sees it, he marvels that he didn't wash before dinner. That he, he, he didn't wash, uh, he, he didn't become, uh, he didn't go through the, the, the normal uh, ritual, not just sort of by the way here. I know we live in a time where we, we've, I don't know about you, I've talked more about hand washing in the last six months than since I was in kindergarten. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you might read this and say, now wait a second, but the, the idea here is not a cleanliness, but it's a ceremonial thing that's happening. Right? It, it's it's uh, their, their traditions and the way that they went about it and the, the way that they did the, the washing. And so it, it's more than just good hygiene that the Pharisee is marveling that he didn't do. But it's really their traditions that they developed around the law. They were so serious about holiness, they had made all sorts of rules to ensure it wasn't possible that you could break the law. And Jesus addresses this, verse 39. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. He says you're so worried about the external. You're so worried about going through your little rituals and your traditions that you've completely neglected the sin in your own heart. That you've, you've missed the point. Verse 40, ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. Verse 40 is very important. You see... There's an expression I, I've often talked to that I don't really like the expression that Christianity people will say Christianity is not about it's not a religion but it's a relationship. Well, I like to twist that and change that into Christianity is a religion about relationships because it is religion in the sense that this is what we believe, this is our our system of belief, this is how we worship our God, but it is driven by the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every other religion, because it is man-made, is merely a set of things to do. It's entirely concerned only on the outside. If you go through the motions, you must be okay. Now, that is sometimes twisted today into, well, as long as you're sincere in whatever you do, you must be okay. And that's, that's a man-made invention as well. And we see that even in this text here. The Pharisees were very sincere in concerning only the things that they were concerned about. But the problem was they had missed a vital truth in verse 40. That God not only made the outside, but he made the inside. He not only made us flesh, he made us spirit. Not only do, are, are, are we uh, creatures of this world, but we're also a, a spiritual creature. And our God is so great that he demands not just your outward obedience, but he demands the devotion of your hearts. That he, he made your heart and he made us to love him. A lot of times people make a, a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and they, they say, you know, the Old Testament was, was all about rules and the New Testament is all about love. And yet, in the book of Deuteronomy, when Moses is giving the law of God, the Ten Commandments, he also gives us what Jesus and others and of his day recognized as the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God 
and then I paraphrase, with all your being and to love your neighbor as yourself. That the, the law of God, the very foundation of, if you will, the Old Testament is, is not some sort of outward obedience, but it is an inward devotion to God. All that we do is to be wrapped up in that. The Pharisees thought you could replace love with a checklist. And so Jesus says that that's their, their foolishness. That God has made both the outside and the inside, and all of that is then his to demand in our devotion to him. In verse 41, Jesus notes that they, they were really only concerned about themselves. So he challenges them, both verse 41, but then also verse 39, that, that they needed to serve others and not themselves. They were known for limiting the service that they would do for other people to, to keeping more for themselves. One of the, the, the ones that Jesus points out is when they would talk about serving their mom and their dad. They'd say, look, we're not really going to help you anymore in your old age. We're just we're going to give what we would have given to you. We'll give it to God and, and we don't have any responsibility towards you, which was not what they should have done and not what the law of God demanded. So Jesus, in verses 42 through 44, he, he explains these charges. He, he plays it out, and, and he, he goes in on this charge of their foolish behavior. In verse 42, he charges them with neglecting the weightier matters of the law while focusing on the smaller parts of the law. He says, Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, so here they were in their tithe, they would receive something and they'd be very careful. You know, I picture the dried herbs that we have today and, and you have, you know, sometimes you get mint and you can get other things. And could you imagine just sort of pouring those flakes out and you're counting through the flakes of it? Nine for me, one for God. And, and how tedious that would be, how long it would take to do that. Uh, how, how, and and, and they, were, they were focused on that. But, verse 42, he says that they pass over judgment and the love of God. They would let others starve. They would let others be uh, maimed. There are times when Jesus, uh, they, they, they try and trip up the Lord Jesus Christ by presenting him one who had a withered hand or who couldn't walk on the Sabbath. And they would, they would see if they could trap Jesus into Healing on the Sabbath. Now you look at that. How could it possibly be wrong to do an act of mercy and love on the Sabbath? Well, it wasn't part of their rules. You could get healed some other day of the week, they would say. But Jesus healed. Healed a man. Restored his hand. Allowed a man to walk. And what did they do? They said, well, it's the Sabbath. You can't do that today. They were so concerned with their rules, they passed over judgment. They passed over love of God. That they missed the forest for the trees. They were so busy in making sure that they, they didn't ever sin, that they sinned by neglecting these weightier matters of the law. Jesus ends that verse saying, these you ought to have done. And not leave the other undone as well. Certainly, there, there's this role of serving God and of, of having a commitment to righteousness. Jesus himself talked about that and wanting to serve the Lord and wanting to give our lives to the Lord. And uh, yet they said they would do that and then just forget everyone else. Forget the law of God. Jesus says, no, no, you, you should do that as you serve other people. The second thing really starts to show it is that they desired the best seats to be seen of men. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the utmost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. I was trying to think, what's the best seat in the church? Isn't it the front row? So you guys are all so selfless. You're leaving the best seats for somebody else. Right? Is that why the front row is almost empty? I don't know. I, I don't know. But anyways, it's just a joke. Um, 
Right? We, we have very comfortable seats. But, you know, the imagery here is that especially when, when he talks about uh, you love the uppermost seats in the synagogue, they, they wanted to be seen. They love the greetings in the marketplace. I don't know about you. I love seeing people I know uh, in, in the grocery store. It, it makes it, you know, it puts a smile on my face. Sometimes it's a little more challenging these days to recognize people uh, because it's, you, know, you can't recognize them. But anyways, uh, you know, I, I like that. I, I love that. But see, this is why they would they'd walk around looking for someone to see them. When they would give uh, a, a an alms in, in the marketplace, when they would give money to the poor and needy, they would blow a trumpet to announce what they were doing. They wanted everybody to see them. They missed something that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to be seen of men, sure, men will see you, and that's your reward, that's it. But the eyes of faith, the heart driven by faith in the Lord says, no, I want, to, I want my God to see who sees in secret. And I want to receive whatever reward he will give to me. They wanted to be seen of men. Jesus says, let your service be done in secret. Because it is for God, it's not for, for men. In verse 44, Jesus describes them as dead men. He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye are graves which appear not and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. He's, he calls them, he says, your graves that don't appear. People don't even know. And he's speaking here to the impact of these scribes and Pharisees who are, who are seeking to, to do ministry, if you will, their, their own way. And it was having no lasting impact. There's no legacy, if you will. They weren't leading people to the Lord. They were drawing people away from Christ. That their lives weren't given in joyful service to the Lord. Their lives were given in, in selfish service to themselves. And therefore, they were hypocrites. They said, this is the way of the Lord, while leading people astray from that. What is perhaps sobering to remember, we, we have read passages like this our whole lives. So when we use the term Pharisee, we don't use it as a compliment. If we were to call somebody a Pharisee, that's not a compliment. But if we were in the days of Jesus and you called someone a Pharisee, it would have been a compliment. They really seemed like they had their stuff together. They seemed like very righteous, godly people. They seemed like, you know, we would call them, you know, the salt of the earth. They seemed that way. But they were just going through external motions. They were just going through the rote routine. They did not have faith. So that the opposition to the Lord and to his ministry came from those who should have been the most uh, desirous and excited about his coming. Those who even knew the scriptures and were seeking to serve God. But they weren't seeking to serve God according to his word and based on faith. They were trying to serve God their own way. So the exhortation, the warning to us is that we would not get trapped in the external. You know, the title of the message I called the foolishness of the external, which after I sent it, I'm, I'm sort of known for typos. If you've received any written thing from me, you know that. You know, external turns into eternal pretty quickly. With, I think with just one letter, but I'm so bad at spelling, that might not be true. But it, 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 in the foolishness of the external is that it misses the eternal. The eternal is that we will forever be with the Lord. The eternal is that real joy, real life, real wealth, real health cannot happen in this life but it happens in the life to come in the presence of our savior. And that is ours, not because we can earn it through some sort of, of super righteous works. It's ours received by faith and what our savior has done alone through his death, burial and resurrection. So may we as the people of God look unto the author and finisher of our faith. May we serve God and serve one another 
out of a love and a zeal for God's work and God's will. Let us pray.